Hello, and welcome to Emanuel Church Rio Rico's online virtual worship for December 1st, 2024. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you grateful for your great love, grateful for your grace, grateful for your presence in our lives. But Lord, we are mindful of many who are suffering around us, those who are going through great distress because of weather crises, those who are suffering from violence and warfare, those who are suffering from financial worries, those who are stressed because of family or relational difficulties. Lord, we lift the, each of these people up to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless them and that your presence might be felt by them wherever they are and whoever they are. And Lord, we pray that we would be vessels of your grace to these. This we pray in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we are starting the season of Advent today. Advent marks the beginning of the church year and is observed on each of the four Sundays before Christmas. Advent takes its name from the Latin word adventus, which means coming, and is the Latin translation of the Greek word parousia, which is often used of the second coming of Jesus. Advent is the season of waiting for and anticipating the coming of Jesus, God in the flesh, whose birthday, Christmas, ends Advent. The four Sundays of Advent represent the eternal themes of the season, hope, love, peace, and joy. Jeremiah 33, 14 lays out the theme of Advent. These days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made. Advent is the time we consciously wait for God to fulfill his promises. Each week we'll recognize the Sundays of Advent by lighting candles on a wreath, with each of the four candles representing a theme of the season. The candles for the first week, hope, second, love, and third, peace, are all purple. And the fourth Sunday candle, or joy, is pink or rose. For Christmas, we light the white Christ candle in the center of the wreath. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor, and imperfect, and who looked forward to something greater to come. May we, as poor in spirit and imperfect as we are, keep our eyes and our hearts focused on the one whose birth we celebrate at Christmas time. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. This week we light the first candle, the prophet's candle, also called the candle of hope. Micah 5.2 says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The birth of Jesus was not some last-minute attempt on God's part to correct a mistake. It had been planned from before creation. God not only knew about it himself, he had promised his people that he would send them a savior through his prophets. Though the fulfillment of those promises might take centuries, God is faithful to meet every promise he has made. This first candle reminds us of the hope that God's people had and continue to have in him. We joyful rem joyfully remember that the birth of Jesus was part of God's plan from the very beginning. I'm calling today's message Promises because that is really what the prophecies that God provided were. They were promises. Promises that he has fulfilled and promises that he will fulfill. And if you remember, the rainbow itself is a sign of God's promise never to destroy the world by uh, flood again. Let's look at these promises of God. Well, first of all, a promise to Zechariah. In Luke chapter 
1, verse 5, we read, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. And just a remind, reminder, those who are priests are the descendants of Aaron in this first century situation. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Now, an aside here, the, the current belief in the time of Zechariah and Elizabeth was that if a woman was childless, it was either because of sin on the woman's part or on the husband's part. There was some falseness, some something wrong with them, and that's why God did not bless them with children. And yet, Luke makes it very clear that they are not guilty of any sin. It says that they followed all of the Lord's commands and decrees perfectly, blamelessly. So it was simply a physical inability to conceive, not any kind of a spiritual fault on their part. Going on to verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, this is not just any incense. This is the the Holy of Holies, and only one priest is allowed to go into this area. And Zechariah has been chosen by priest, uh, by lot, to go in as the priest to burn this incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Now, just another aside here. We have to remember when anyone is working in the service of Lord of the Lord, the people who are outside of that service, who are not taking part in it, but are praying are just as much a part of the work as the one who's performing that work. In other words, it was important that Zechariah had prepared himself spiritually and emotionally and physically, but it was just as important that the worshipers outside, while he was performing this work for the Lord, were praying because our prayers lift up those who serve the Lord. Verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Now, we do not have a description of the angel here. We do not know if this is uh, some an, a messenger of God who appears to be a human, but clothed in brilliant white clothes, as sometimes happens in the Gospel of Luke. We do not know if he is uh, uh, beyond uh, what we would expect more than a man, more than a, a human, more than a person. We just know that when he appears to Zechariah in this place where nobody but Zechariah should be, Zechariah is shocked and he's terrified. He's gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. The announcement that angels have to say over and over again, don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Your prayer has been heard. Now, this is not the prayer necessarily that he's offering now, but the prayer that he's he's been praying for many years, decades, undoubtedly. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you're to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or any other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Now, of course, this John that is being prophesied here by the angel Gabriel, who is the announcing angel in this whole first part of Luke, I should point out. But this John is the one we know as John the baptizer. He is the one that is preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. So this, this announcement is not just an announcement uh, of a blessing that Zechariah is going to have a son, even though he's an old man, and even though his wife is past an age at which she, she could reasonably ex be expected to have a child. But this is also the announcement that the Messiah is coming and that John will function as Elijah, preparing the way for the coming of Jesus Christ. And this promise is one that we will see fulfilled later in the book of Luke, but we don't go into that right now. The promise that Zechariah receives is a promise to answer his prayer, but to go beyond what his prayer even was because often this is what God does. Remember, Zechariah and Elizabeth were holy, godly people. They led blameless, faultless lives. God chose them because he knew they would raise little John the right way. He would be a Nazarite from before his birth. And that is something that was unusual in and of itself. Normally, one took a Nazarite vow as an adult, one who was capable of choosing to abide by the terms of that vow. But John was part of a vow that his parents would make for him and that he would faithfully carry out throughout his life because he was the one who had to make the way straight for the coming of the Lord Jesus. This promise was a vital promise to Zechariah. But I want to look at a promise to another Zechariah. Now, this promise is a little more general, but it's one that's important for us to know. Starting in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1, we read, The word of the Lord Almighty came to me, Zechariah the prophet. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at that time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. Zechariah 8, 1 through 8. Now this promise, of course, is one made to Zechariah about Jerusalem, about the nation of Israel, but in a greater sense, it is a promise to all people that God will bring peace and wholeness and righteousness to his people, that the people of God, all of the people, will be blessed. He talks about the aged men and women sitting there with canes because of their great age, and they needed to help them get away around because they did not die in their youth. 
talks about boys and girls playing in the streets of the city. Uh, and in another part of this, it talks about those who were unable to even get a wage for their work. They just had to work and couldn't expect to be paid. That that would no longer be the case. That that there would be justice, that there would be righteousness, that there would be holiness. God is promising righteousness and holiness. And this later Zechariah we just read about will be the father of the one who prepares the one who will bring that righteousness, that holiness, that goodness. And that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, all of these things are brought about because of the strength of God's love. The psalmist writes in Psalm 46, starting in verse 9, He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We, we don't always think of the love of God as a source of strength, but in fact, it is the greatest strength. It is the way that wars are stopped. It is the way that violence is, is stilled. It is the way that God is truly exalted. When God says, be still and know that I am God, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. It's not just talking about some future time. It means now. In a way, it's saying, I am and will be exalted among the nations. I am and will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. But not just that. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. 1 John 4, 17 through 18. The love that it's talking about here is not just the love of God. You see, perfect also means mature in Greek, the same word for both concepts. So a mature love of the believer, one who is filled with the love of God, one who is filled with the love of Jesus, is not afraid. And John even tells us why. Fear has to do with punishment. And the one who is afraid, the one who fears, is not made mature or perfect in love. We trust God. And the love of God fills us. The love of God sustains us. This is the very promise that we read about from the prophet Zechariah. We do not need to be afraid, no matter what comes our way, because we know God, we trust in God, we love him, and we have no need to be afraid, because we are filled with, by, and for the love of God. The coming of the Messiah, his first coming, and his second coming that we also anticipate has no need for us to be afraid, no reason for us to have any fear. We need only trust the Lord our God. He will save us and he will love us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how we love you, how we praise you, and how we thank you for your great and abiding love for us. Lord, thank you for the promises you have made that we have seen fulfilled and that we anticipate being fulfilled in our own lives. Fill us with your love. Help us to become perfect lovers, mature in our faith and love. 
This we ask in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Go in hope and may God bless you.